Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're plunging into uh, the world of timber technology. Yeah, it's a really interesting area. We've got this uh, timber technology paper, two questions and answers document here. A good source seems quite practical. Exactly. Our mission basically is to pull out the key stuff about wood. You know, what it is, how we work with it. Sort of a quick guide to the fundamentals. Yeah, a rapid rundown. We want you to walk away understanding timber better, its properties, common issues, basic shaping. Should be pretty eye-opening. Ready? Absolutely. It's amazing how much we use wood without really thinking about, well, the details, the structure. So much depth there. Definitely. Okay, let's get into it. The source starts with classifying timber, right? Softwood versus hardwood, and it flags pine as a softwood. Mm -hmm. For someone just looking at a plank, what's the actual difference? Why does that classification matter? Well, the basic difference is botanical, really. Softwoods like pine, fir, spruce, they come from coniferous trees, needles and cones, that sort of thing. Hardwoods, oak, maple, birch, they're from deciduous trees, the ones with broad leaves that usually drop in autumn. Right. But here's the slightly confusing bit. Softwood doesn't always mean it's physically softer. Oh, uh, okay. That's counterintuitive. It is. It's more about the tree's biology. But generally speaking, softwoods often grow faster, so their wood structure tends to be less dense. Which usually means... Usually means they're a bit easier to cut and shape. Gotcha. So focusing on pine, then. The source mentions specific properties. Lightweight, easy to work with, pale color, straight grain, those knots we always see. Yeah, the classic pine look. What do those properties tell us? Where does <laughs> pine really shine and maybe where isn't it the best choice? Well, those properties make it super versatile. Lightweight, that's great for construction, furniture making, easier handling. Reduces the slog. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And being easy to work with is a massive plus, especially if you're just starting out. It cuts nicely, takes nails and glue well. Right. Beginner friendly. Very much so. The straight grain helps with strength along the board's length, vital for framing and stuff. Mm. And it takes paint or stain beautifully. Loads of finishing options. Okay, so lots of positives. What about downsides? Well, that lower density means it can dent and scratch more easily than, say, oak. So maybe not ideal for a heavy-use tabletop, for example. Makes sense. And the knots, they can look nice, add character, you know. But structurally, they're interruptions in the grain. Potential weak spots if you're not careful where you place them in a design. Okay. But interestingly, that relative softness, it actually makes it quite good at absorbing shock. Really? Like how? think packaging crates or even sometimes as a subfloor layer it has a bit of give huh wouldn't have thought of that shock absorption mm -hmm. okay so wood isn't always perfect coming from the mill right defects oh definitely not part of working with a natural material our source mentions knots wormholes and splits and bowing comes up elsewhere too can you quickly break those down what causes them sure Knots, as we said, are just where branches grew out of the trunk. A live knot is sound, fixed in place, but it still messes with the grain pattern. Okay. Wormholes, pretty self-explanatory. Tunnels from wood-boring insects obviously weakens the timber. Right, pests. Yep. Splits are cracks along the grain, often near the ends. Usually caused by uneven drying, the wood shrinks at different rates, causing stress. Ah, drying issues. And bowing is that lengthwise warp or curve makes getting flat surfaces a real challenge. Defects can come from how the tree grew, bugs, or, crucially, how it's handled and dried after felling. Okay, so if these things can cause problems, how do we avoid them, or at least minimize them? The source has suggestions. For knots, it says cut from clear sections or buy higher grades. What makes a grade higher? Higher grades are essentially sorted for quality. They look at the number and size of defects knots included. So fewer imperfections. Exactly. Fewer smaller knots, straighter grain, less of other issues. You pay more, but you get more consistency. If you're using a lower grade, you just have to be smarter about cutting work around the big knots for crucial parts. A bit like picking the best part of a piece of fabric, maybe. Sort of, yeah. Good analogy. Okay, what about wormholes? The fix mentioned is treated timber or kiln drying. How do they stop the bugs? Treated timber is infused with chemicals, preservatives that make the wood toxic or just unappetizing to insects, and they also fight off rot. Okay, chemical warfare for wood. Pretty much. Kiln drying is different. You put the timber in a controlled oven, heat it up. Right. This kills any bugs, larvae, eggs already in the wood. But maybe more importantly, it drastically lowers the moisture content. Ah, uh, dries it right out. Yeah, usually down to like 6-8% for indoor use. 
Dry wood is way less attractive to bugs, and it's much more stable, less likely to warp or twist later. Two birds with one stone, then. Exactly. And for splits. Proper seasoning and avoiding overnailing. Tell me more about seasoning. Is that different from kiln drying? It is, though the goal is similar controlled drying. Seasoning is often air drying. You stack the timber carefully with little sticks called stickers between layers. To let air flow? Precisely. Allows air to circulate all around so it dries slowly and evenly. This minimizes those internal stresses that cause splits when one part dries faster than another. Kiln drying is just a much faster, more controlled version of that process. Got it. Slower, natural drying versus faster, artificial. Right. And over nailing, jamming too many nails in, especially near the ends, that physically forces the wood fibers apart and can easily cause splits. So right nail size, right placement. Okay, makes sense. Understanding the material helps avoid wrecking it. Fundamentally, yes. Right. Let's say we have a decent piece now, maybe kiln dried. How do we prep it? Mm -hmm. Get those nice straight square edges. Our source lays out six steps. Ah, the sequence for milling timber square, yes. Inspect and mark, cross cut to length, plane one face flat, then plane one edge square to that face, mm -hmm. then thickness the opposite face, and finally rip the opposite edge. Yeah. Why that specific order? It's all about establishing reliable reference surfaces. Think of it like building blocks. Mm -hmm. You need a perfectly flat base to build on. Okay. So first, you plane one face totally flat. That's your primary reference, dead true. Your starting point. Exactly. Then you plane one edge perfectly square 90 degrees to that flat face. Now you have two true surfaces meeting at a right angle. Face and edge. Got it. Then the next steps rely on those. You use a thickness planer, which references off that first flat face, to make the opposite face parallel and bring the board to the right thickness. Okay, parallel faces. And finally, you use a table saw, referencing off that first true edge, to cut the opposite edge parallel, bringing the board to the final width. So each step uses the previous one's accuracy. Precisely. It prevents errors from adding up, do it out of order, and you'll likely end up with something wonky. It guarantees a square, accurately dimensioned piece. Very logical when you lay it out like that. Like a little algorithm for wood. Ha, huh. yeah, kind of. The source also quickly shows two modifications. A chamfer and a rebate. Symbol sketches, what are they? Yeah, basic edge treatments. A chamfer is just knocking off the sharp corner, creating a little bevel, a slope. Why do that? Could be for looks, make it feel nicer to touch or sometimes just to make the edge more durable, less likely to splinter or chip. Okay, and a rebate. A rebate is a rectangular groove or step cut along the edge or face, like cutting out a little rectangular section. And that's used for? Often for joining things, like fitting a back panel into a cabinet frame or maybe letting a piece of glass sit flush in a picture frame. Creating a recess, basically. Got it, one softens, one recesses. Simple but useful. Okay, let's talk joining, putting pieces together. The example is a basic timber partition frame, like for an internal wall. Right, standard stud wall framing. Six steps listed. Measure and cut the bits. Lay out the plates, top and bottom horizontals. Yeah. Mark where the studs verticals go. Assemble it. Put in extra studs, jack and king, for openings like doors. And add noggins, horizontal braces. Mm -hmm. Sounds about right. Can you quickly explain the rules? Plates, studs, noggins. Sure. The plates top and bottom are the horizontal foundation and cap of the wall frame. The studs are the main vertical supports running between the plates. They carry the load. The uprights. Yep. Noggins or blocking are those shorter horizontal pieces fitted between the studs. They do a couple of things. Stop the studs from twisting or bowing sideways and provide fixing points for attaching things like plasterboard. Adds rigidity. Okay, stiffens the whole grid. Exactly. And then around openings doors, windows, you need extra support. The jack and king studs. Right. The king stud goes full height, floor to ceiling, right beside the opening. The jack stud is shorter. It sits under the ends of the header. The header beam. The horizontal beam across the top of the opening. The jack stud holds up the header, and the header carries the load from the studs above it, transferring it down through the jack studs to the floor. Ah, so it bridges the gap and redirects the weight. Precisely. Critical for maintaining the wall's strength when you cut a hole in it. It's a whole system, isn't it? Each piece doing its job. Very much a system. Elegant, really. Okay. Can't do any of this without tools. And safety first, always. The source uses a circular saw example. Names the parts blade, base plate, guard, handle, trigger, depth adjustment. Standard stuff. Yep, basic anatomy of the tool. But then it stresses, safe hand position start, middle, end of cut. Why is that so important with a circular saw? Control, control, control. 
<laughs> and keeping fingers away from spinning things. Obviously. The recommended grip, one hand on the front handle, one on the rear trigger handle, gives you maximum stability. It helps you guide the saw straight and resist any tendency for it to jump or worse, kick back towards you. Kick back sounds bad. It is. Can happen if the blade binds in the wood. A firm two-handed grip is your best defense. Keeping the base plate flat on the wood throughout the cut is also key for safety and accuracy. Right. And seems obvious, but let the blade stop completely before you put the saw down. Never lift it while it's still spinning down. Good habits. What about the actual cutting procedure? Six steps again. Measure, mark, secure the wood, set the blade depth, align, cut smoothly. Seems thorough. Each step is there for a reason, minimizing risk and maximizing accuracy. Measure and mark carefully obvious, but crucial. Measure twice, cut once. The classic rule, <laughs> securing the workpiece, clamping it down firmly is vital. You don't want the wood shifting while you're cutting. That's dangerous and leads to a messy cut. Okay. Setting the blade depth correctly just a little bit deeper than the wood thickness, maybe a few millimeters is important too. Too shallow, it won't cut through. Way too deep, you expose more blade than necessary, increasing risk and potentially straining the motor. Right, just enough to get through. Exactly. Aligning the blade carefully with your mark before you pull the trigger ensures accuracy. And then, yes, a smooth, steady push. Don't force it, let the saw do the work. Rushing leads to mistakes. Almost always, slow and steady wins the race, especially with power tools. Absolutely. Okay, one last little bit from the source, a quick look at symbols. Sketches for a door and a window and a wooden building plan. Ah, architectural shorthand. Why include these? What do they tell us instantly? They're part of the universal language of building plans. The door symbol usually shows which way it swings. Using an arc instantly tells you about clearance and flow. Right, you know where the door will move. Exactly. In. The window symbol, typically a rectangle in the wall line, maybe with a line or two inside representing glass panes, just clearly marks an opening for glazing. Simple visual cues. Very simple, very effective. Anyone on a job site, regardless of their primary language, can look at those symbols on a drawing and understand door here, window there, essential for communication. Fantastic. Okay, let's recap. In, well, not very long at all. We've covered quite a bit. We have, yeah. Understanding timber basics, softwood, pines properties. Identifying common defects like knots, wormholes, splits, and how to prevent or manage them. Mm -hmm. The preventative stuff is key. Then, the step-by-step -step for preparing timber, getting those true edges, a look at basic joinery with that partition frame example. Studs, plates, noggins. Exactly. And essential tool use and safety, focusing on the circular saw, plus a quick peek at drawing symbols. It's a solid foundation, really. Covers the life cycle from understanding the material to basic shaping and assembly. What strikes me is how much is involved in just you know, a piece of wood. We see it everywhere, but there's this whole layer of knowledge. Absolutely. It connects the natural material science with practical craft skills. Hmm. Understanding why wood behaves the way it does helps you work with it, not against it. Right. So for you listening, here's something to maybe think about. The next time you're looking at wood could be your desk, a door frame, maybe even just a log in the park. Mm -hmm. Take a second look. Think about its grain. Can you spot any knots? Consider its properties. Is it hard, soft, how might it have been shaped? Which steps we talked about might have been used? Yeah, try to see the story in the wood. Exactly.